Hello, all my comedy friends. Um, back with another Menander lecture. Um, tonight we're going to be talking about his play, The Discolos. Um, I realize that the uh, previous lecture cut off just as I was starting to talk about Alexander. I don't know why that is. Um, well, I do know why that is, and that's basically because I'm not very good at online stuff. But um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Alexander. Actually, I'm not really going to talk about Alexander himself. I'm going to talk more about uh, the uh, impact he had culturally, um, which is a different, slightly different subject. But before I do that, um, I want to start because, you know, comedy. So let's start with a joke. I made this one up before. Uh, what do you call it when your teacher has to record lectures to present them to you? A co-video. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, it's funny. I don't care if you like it or not. Shut up. Um, so let's talk a little bit about uh, Menander. I, I can't remember if I gave you his dates before or not. Um, I still have my notes, so I probably should have dug those out. Uh, but his dates are... Um, uh, 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 344 to uh, 292, I think it is. Uh, so that's BCE. Those dates are, of course, BCE. Um, so, so Menander's 344 to 292 BCE. So during this time, of course, as we've been talking about in the class, um, there's been a lot of shifts in Athenian uh, life. Uh, the most important shift uh, is their loss of centrality in the economic and political, um, uh, or I should say, yeah, the loss of centrality in the economic and political spheres of the life of the Western Mediterranean. I mean, they're still important, but they're not, they're no longer the, the major players that they were, you know, 50 years, 60 years or, uh, prior to this. And the reason why I mention that is because that I think that's concomitant with the shift uh, from old comedy through middle comedy. Now remember, with old comedy and middle comedy, we only have Aristophanes, so we're just basing it off his plays. Uh, to Menander, and actually, when it comes to Menander, we for new comedy we really only have his plays as well. Um, talk more about that when we do Roman tragedy uh, in a few days. Um, but Menander, Menander, when Menander is born, so 344, again, you know, what we think, um, when Menander is born, uh, he's an Athenian, uh, the, the culture of Athens is shifting away from the mode of cultural dominance that it had in the, uh, prior century towards, uh, 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 still respected, but relatively minor, still relative, or, or yeah, uh, uh, let me start over, from the, the, the dominant force to a, just a player uh, in the game. Um, and uh, that's the kind of Athens that Menander grew up in. So how does all that happen? Well, a little bit about this I talked already about uh, um Athens, after they lose the Peloponnesian War and then the series of hegemonies that uh, the Greek world goes through, um, and uh, then down into the conquest of Philip of Macedon, and then after Philip dies, now Philip basically has brought the whole Greek-speaking world under control, but when his son Alexander takes over, his eyes uh, are a little bit wider, and uh, so he sets out and it does eventually conquer what amounts to the entire known world at the time. He dies in 323. So Menander is what three, four, or I should say, sorry, 44 minus 23 is 21. So just about the round, the time that Menander is coming into his full adulthood. Um, just to carry on with this for a second, uh, uh, after, uh, Alexander dies, his kingdom gets uh, basically carved up into four chunks. 
ruled by, uh, well, mostly by um, dudes that he uh, went to, he'd been friends with in school. Um, and uh, um, uh, this is a side note, but Alexander's body actually got shipped around from city to city because um, everybody, all the competing kings wanted to, if they could lay claim to the body of Alexander, then they could lay claim to the rightful kingship, you know, or whatever, whatever. Um, uh, so, yeah, so Alexander dies 323. Uh, it, the kingdom gets divided up into chunks, uh, but uh, the Athens of Menander never gets back to um, its full political self-determination because it isn't long before the Romans roll through um, and uh, uh, um, conquer everything. And uh, uh, they, the Romans, we'll talk about this more when we get to Roman tragedy, but the Romans uh, had a funny relationship with Greek culture um, in that they there were parts of it that they deeply respected, but then there were also parts of it that they uh, did not like. And like any dominating force, they picked and chose the things they liked. One of the things they really liked is Menander. Um, so, but again, we'll leave that to later. Um, when we talk about Plautus and Terence in a lecture or two, um, so 344 to 292 BCE or Menander states, uh, growing up in this Alexandrian slash post-Alexandrian universe uh, where you're not making, you're not calling the shots anymore. I know I talked about this in the last lecture, uh, but there's a dynamic that I did not, or probably got cut off the last video uh, with, with the conquest of Alexander. And it has to do with the way that you think about yourself um, in the in the world around you, uh, for an Athenian in the world before Alexander, you're calling all the shots. Like not just for yourself, not just for your family or, or your neighborhood or your city, but you're pretty much calling the shots for everybody um, in the Western Mediterranean. Um, the votes that you take at assembly are votes that affect people who live in places where you would never ever go to um, or ever get to go to. I, maybe that's a better way of putting it. And, uh, um, but nonetheless, you feel your, import, your political importance. And um, I think, again, to get back to the structures of comedy, I think that this informs the way that people wrote comedies. Uh, I know I shouldn't, I know I've already said this a million times to you guys, but I'm going to say it again. Aristophanes comedy, very political, very topical, names, names, uh, you know, people that he talks about are people who are out there sitting in the audience, um, and, uh, you know, doesn't bow away from, you know, uh, that day's news, shall we say. And, uh, but Menander is different. Menander, when you look at Menander, and now we're going to get into the Discolos, um, when you look at Menander, things are uh, things have changed a little bit, right? So let me grab my notes here real quick. Um, all right. So to begin with, let's think about what we're looking on the stage here. And then what's his dad's name? I can't remember. All the names are the same in New Comedy, so it's hard to... Uh, uh, Callipides. So the way the stage is set up, what you're... This is a top-down view, not a front-on view. Oh, it, it, maybe it could be. There are a few columns in here. Now it's a front-on view. Uh, on, as you look at it uh, on stage left, uh, or I mean, it doesn't really matter which is stage right and stage left, but you've got the, the, the farm of this dude, Kinemon. Okay, so he's our Discolos of the title. I'm going to come back to that in just a moment. He is a very particular 
character type in comedy. Uh, and then you have a shrine, the shrine to Pan in the middle, and then you have a, an estate and a house that's owned by this wealthy uh, city dweller by the name of Callipides. Um, okay, so it is Pan that delivers the prologue, um, and it's very, this is very Euripidean um, to have the god come out and deliver the prologue and say, what's where and who, well, actually, we're, I think we're missing that part. I don't know my text, I can't, my text is in my office. Um, uh, and my iPad is broken, so I can't even look it up online while I review this. So don't, you know, okay. So Pan enters with the prologue. Um, it's, but the Pan entering with the prologue is very much in Euripides style. Um, uh, if we remember back to the Ion, um, and even the Alcestis, those plays are introduced with a prologue. Um, it's given by a god or a goddess. Um, so Pan represents uh, the things that his dad represents. His dad is Hermes, which means that he represents, you know, kind of like that strange uh, junction between wildness and uh, uh, civilization. Um, yeah, that's what he represents um, by and large. Uh, and that's going to be appropriate within this play. Let me go back to the title, Lidiskalos. This is the Greek title of the play. Uh, usually it's translated, I forget what our, the translation that I put on the syllabus calls it, something like the angry old man, uh, the grumpy old man, or the, the bad-tempered man. Uh, I think bad-tempered man is the one that our translation calls it. Uh, they all mean, you know, roughly the same thing. He's not a nice guy to be around. He doesn't like other people. Uh, and his, most of the time in the first half of the play, his action, or the action of the play centers around establishing this character uh, of, of Kinemon. Kinemon, whose name means uh, Shin, Shinbone. Shinbone. I had to put pants on for this one. But yeah, your shin bone. So why is he called shin bone? Because you never notice your shin. You don't even think about your shin until you run it into something, until you bang it on something, until it hurts. And then you notice it. So nobody notices Kanemon uh, as such until he starts affecting their lives. Um, and he starts affecting their lives when Callipides' son, Sostratos, shows up, who takes one look at Kanemon's daughter and falls in love with her. Um, and that's how it works uh, in comedy, to use uh, Shakespeare's uh, uh, quote, nobody ever fell in love who didn't fall in love at first sight, um, and uh, which is uh, more of a directive for uh, uh, drama than it is for real life. but. Um, yeah, okay. So he falls in love and uh, decides that he has to woo this young girl's heart. But of course, Kanemon, Kanemon hates everybody. He doesn't want to be around anybody. So in this sense, he provides us uh, with a particular template, template that we're going to come across through, uh, come across in later comedy. He is one of the archetypal misanthropes. So the miss here means uh, doesn't like, hates. The anthro is uh, people, other people. Uh, so it's a person who hates other people, um, doesn't like to be around other people, uh, who is, uh, well, this is actually a good play uh, in terms of social distancing. Um, so he doesn't want other people around. So he you know, tries to drive uh, social just off his land. Um, uh, Kneman himself has a young son by the name of Gorgias. Now, let me just, I'm going to give you a warning here in that this play has a relatively small cast of characters uh, as far as new comedy and Roman comedy goes. So, sorry, uh, get used to it. Um, uh, I mean, I don't know. I don't want to spend too much time on the plot of the play. It's, uh, the, the crux of the play is basically guy falls down a well. Um, and has to be rescued. So, uh, there are some funny things that happen 
uh, Sostratus decides, uh, or no, it's actually Dallas, his slave, Dallas, right? Yeah, I told you that this name was coming back. Now I need a new piece of paper. You kids, your coronavirus and your immunity. Dallas is the Dallas is the uh, name of the slave. I told you last class. Get used to this. This is going to become a stock name. And in fact, when you look at the names in the play, they're all they're all kind of stock names. Like you can tell what you're supposed to think about from the character uh, just by their name. Naaman, I already talked about him. His name means uh, uh, shinbone. Um, his son is Gorg so Gorgias is a, a very common George basically. Uh, so very common standard uh, uh, name in the ancient world. And then you turn over here and you look at Callip Callipides and Sostratos. So uh, Callipides, his name means literally what his name means is uh, the, the, the son of, of beauty. This, uh, um, and Sostratos is another uh, stock name. But they both indicate sort of like well-to-do upper middle classness. Uh, these are the sorts of names like, you know, Fenton or um, uh, Stretford that I made those up. <laughs> I don't uh, <laughs> Stretford. I, I don't know where that came from. But uh, anyway, um, <laughs> um, uh, maybe the Strut. Uh, Sten and Sostratos, but these are names that you, again, that you associate with sort of upper middle classness. And, and so the whole play uh, kind of centers around this kind of, I mean, they have to go through a money negotiation because Kanaman thinks that because he owns this valuable piece of land that everybody's just out to get that valuable piece of land so he won't let his daughter get married because he's afraid that he's going to lose this valuable piece of land in the marriage contract. Um, yeah. So, um, uh, uh, and then uh, his uh, maid, uh, uh, Simike, what, uh, drops the bucket down the well, and then the, they all try to go find it, and eventually Kanaman ends up at the bottom of the well. Uh, and has to be rescued, and Sostratos plays a part in the rescue, um, along with Gorgias and the slave Dallas, and then Kanaman, who has been miraculously rec uh, rescued, but with a, um, a hurt leg, a, a broken leg, whatever, I don't know what the, they don't specify what the injury is, but it's bad enough that he can't get up and walk around, uh, says that, uh, okay, now he agrees to the marriage of Sostratos and his daughter, so they get married. There's a big party at the end of everything um, where the cook and the slave drag Kanaman unwillingly out of his house and make him party with everybody else, right? So, again, we go back to the theme in comedy. So, I... So what, what changes from old comedy to new comedy is you don't have all of the dirty jokes. There's no dirty jokes in the Discordus that I can think of. There may, oh no, actually there is one. I can think of one. Uh, well, it's not even, it wasn't even intended by, it wasn't even intended as a joke. Uh, or, or maybe it was, I don't know. Uh, but it happens at the, the marriage of uh, Sostratos and Canadian South, who I don't think is named. Is she named? I don't think she actually even gets a name in this play. Um, I don't know. Maybe she doesn't. I just don't know where it comes at. But she's certainly not named by name. She's certainly not named by name more than once or twice. And I don't think she's named at all in the play. Um, uh, but you can imagine a name like, you know, Calistrata or uh, 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 Demia. Uh, you know, uh, which means like citizen's, citizen's daughter, you know, uh, she would, if she is named, she would have a name, a stock name along those lines too, because again, these are, this is not political. This is, this is topic or situational, right? This is um, a sitcom basically. And as such, uh, you can actually think about Menander deriving more from Euripides, from Euripides, from the Euripidean tradition than actually from the Aristophanic tradition, right? Because when you, if you look at a play like the Ion, yes, the Ion is, is taking its source material out of an older myth. Uh, and yes, there is, uh, as I talked about 
um, to you uh, earlier in the semester, borrowing you know from its contemporary circumstances, and, and there's Athenian propaganda, um, um, and so there's it's still sort of topical, uh, but it's basically a sitcom. You know the ion. You know the end. Don't tell dad. <laughs> it's not really the dad, and everyone walks off laughing. And uh, uh, and Menander kind of follows along more in, in line with that than his comedy falls in line uh, with Aristophanes. And uh, I've already said name and names and being very topically political. Why is that? Uh, well, uh, my explanation and the explanation that other scholars have offered up, and I follow along with them. This is not original to me, uh, but it is something that I agree with, um, is that uh, uh, comedy becomes less political uh, be, uh, as, a, as a, a kind of as a function of uh, the actual Athenians loss of the centrality of their own political identity. I think that makes sense. Uh, so when you are on when you're on top of the world and when you are calling the shots, you can make jokes about yourself and be pretty pretty sure that everyone's going to get those jokes because um, if they don't, they're not hit, right? Um, but then when you're not no longer the center of the intellectual, economic, military universe, um, then your jokes have to kind of play to a larger audience. Then you have to kind of um, deal with these more universal. Uh, uh, sorts of situations, uh, the kinds of things that everybody can relate to. Uh, I could run down a line with examples uh, from modern comic expressions, uh, but I, I, I won't do that. Uh, I'm sure you could think of plenty of them uh, right off the top of your bat. Okay, I'll give you one of them. Fat, unattractive guy married to um, inexplicably hot wife. So you can go back to the Flintstones with that. And you can, well, not so much the Honeymooners, because she's not. I'm sorry, Siren. Um, uh, the Honeymooners uh, fits into that paradigm. Uh, the Simpsons fits into that paradigm. Family Guy fits into that paradigm, and it's going to keep being repeated um, again and again because, uh, you know, it's the first rule of comedy. Once people find something funny once, they'll find it funny forever. Um, and the, probably the uh, well from this play, the best example of that is guy falls down a hole. Never not funny as long as it's not you. Um, so uh, yeah, so uh, I, that's a, that's kind of all I really want to say about the discolos. Um, let me think if I missed anything. I probably did. Uh, so Sertos's name um, is fashion means fashionable. Um, Yeah, that's pretty much all I want to say. We have one more play to do by Menander, um, The Girl from Samos, which is, uh, or the Samia, uh, which is in my, it's fragmentary. It's, it, it doesn't exist in its entirety. Um, but uh, I, I sort of like it a little bit better uh, than the Discolos. Um, so talked about Alexander. Talked about, oh, I know, there's one, one more. Of course, there's one more thing. I know you hate me. Um, I won't take too long on this, I promise. Uh, but it's the, uh, so I, I'm going to, so we, okay. So we're, uh, so basically what, what I've been doing in this class is looking at the development of comedy through two different uh, uh, spectra, through two, two different lenses. Um, one is the way that history goes, right? But the other is the way that history affects the society in which the comedy is produced and how that also therefore changes the comedy. Okay, so we talked already a little bit about the history of Alexander and after Alexander. Um, 
which is a great course at Brooklyn College, um, usually taught by Professor Kellogg. So if it's offered, enroll in it because she's great. Um, uh, so uh, I, I think about this. Uh, I think about the sort of, sort of step back from uh, what it would have been like for somebody like Menander, right? So Menander is born um, as Alexander is uh, beginning his conquest or grow be, is beginning to grow up as Alexander is doing his conquests, right? Kind of uh, uh, comes of age as Alexander's uh, fame is everywhere. Everyone knows who Alexander is. Uh, he he's conquered everything that everybody knows about. Um, and then uh, he dies. Alexander dies when you're 21. Um, so, you know, 21 didn't necessarily have the same exact significance as it did for the Greeks, as it does for us. But we all know, you know, every culture has its age at which uh, uh, a man or, or, I'm sorry, a boy or a girl becomes a man or a woman. Um, and, and, and so it's 21 for us, uh, but they all occur about the same age because human biology. And uh, um, so you're 21, Alexander dies, and then all of a sudden this uh, whole world that has been conquered by Alexander splits up into four packets. And uh, they don't get along necessarily. Uh, sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. I mean, the Greeks. So uh, they... The, uh, uh, they're ancient Greeks, I should say. And so they uh, like to fight uh, each other. Um, uh, except when some... Uh, it's, it's, they're, it's, the Greeks are a funny family. Uh, uh, they will tear each other's throats out, um, you know, when they're at home. They'll tear each other's throats out when they're at home. But gee, if somebody comes in from outside, they're all together. And uh, 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 it doesn't always, well, obviously, it didn't uh, succeed for them ultimately. But, and, and it, well, it did, but also it didn't. All things, uh, all things grow and all things wither. Um, so, uh, where was I going with this? Oh, yeah, after Alexander. So, But in any case, as an Athenian, having grown up through all this process, like you can't, when we talk about Menander, sorry, I live on a major through route for uh, uh, ambulances and fire trucks, so there are uh, sirens uh, constantly here. Um, the, uh, uh, anyway. Uh, you're no longer the uh, direct um, kind of uh, or central determining force on the contours of your own universe. You can't make jokes about Alexander. Uh, why? Because he might uh, hear about them. He might see the plays. And uh, uh, okay, so let me let me. Uh, well, I'm going to make a quick note of this. One more thing after this one that I have to talk about. Um, I'm just making a note. It's a word that you'll know. I'm just making a note of it so I don't forget to come back to it. Um, so, uh, so the, the, there's a there's a, uh, a there's a, 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 a psychological shift that happens with the conquest of Alexander and carries over into the not very, like I said, not very far off in the future, less than about 80 years before the Romans roll in and, uh, um, you know, take over everything. Um, uh, but like I said, we'll talk about that with Roman uh, comedy. Um, so the, what I'm, I'll, let me, I'll cut, cut, I'll make a long story short. I'll try to cut this short. What I'm really trying to get at here, and I would have talked more, but uh, I can uh, just say what, say things. Because um, uh, none of you can, you're not here, who cares? No one's going to watch this. Um, so, 
I think the, the there's a, there's a sort of a there's a there's a paradox. There's kind of a psychological paradox that uh, takes place during this time period, uh, in the sense that the world the world all of a sudden becomes very small, it becomes a lot smaller, right? Because now you after when Alexander conquers everything, you uh, as a Greek can now go out and basically go it, to places that you never even like you've heard of, but you would never have ever dreamt of going to. Um, uh, it's possible now, though there are travel routes up, and let me tell you, uh, just for example, Alexander built roads and uh, that are still in use today. Uh, so, or, or roads maybe is the wrong word, but he mapped out travel routes, uh, and those travel routes are still... They're still used today because he found the best way to get from one place to another, i.e. i.e. he conquered a city and then heard about another city and uh, found the quickest way to get there and then conquered that city. Um, uh, so, yeah, I'm not, I don't want to oversell Alexander's... Uh, I, I, well, anyway, he killed a lot of people. I'll just leave it at that. Um, and... Uh, or was respons responsible for the death of a lot of people. Um, but so Alexander uh, spreads out of the uh, Greek speaking world and uh, basically conquers uh, Greece and Egypt and um, uh, basically all of Asia Minor. Uh, remember, the coast of Asia Minor was already Greek, so he didn't have any problems there. But uh, you know, as you get farther inland, you start running into the Persians, and then you have to fight the Persians. And um, he made basically, to make a long story short, he, from the best uh, evidence that I've seen, he made it to India, to what we think of India, certainly to Afghanistan these days, because we uh, we know he went through the Khyber Pass, so that's uh, Pakistan, uh, and then uh, probably into India as well. Um, so, uh, but he died. Uh, he never made it back to Greece. Um, why he died uh, remains uh, some area of argument. Anyway, so never mind. Forget that. Like I said, take Professor Kellogg's course. She does it much better than I can. Um, uh, and the, uh, so the upshot, what I think of as the upshot to Alexander's conquest and the post-Alexandrian world is that, first of all, the world becomes much smaller. Um, tra like I said before, travel routes are opened up. You get direct news from places that you had only ever maybe read a reference to in one or two sources somewhere at some point. Um, so the world is a lot smaller uh, of a place. Uh, but at the same time, the world is also a lot bigger of a place uh, in the sense that now the world isn't just your polis. The world isn't just your city-state. The world is this interconnected network um, of uh, places that, that go farther than you might ever really have imagined about. And so from that perspective, it's kind of comparable to the internet um, in that the internet uh, makes the world a smaller place. You can get on your FaceTime uh, and talk to your cousin in China or, you know, or your, you know, your buddy on their year abroad in Budapest or, you know, what, who gives a point? Uh, or your your mom in Pittsburgh, as the case may be. Uh, not that any of us would ever do that. Um, but uh, so it's small. It's just, it makes the world a smaller place. Uh, it can bring people together, right? But at the same time, the internet makes the world a huge, much huger place. Um, in 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 that it now there is this like you know what if I wanted to go. I, I, okay, so I'm, I'm just making this example up off my head. This doesn't mean anything uh, um, particular or specific to me. But if I, if I was, uh, you know, I'll just choose a random age, 16, 17 years old, and I wanted to know uh, what the uh, uh, population of uh, South Africa was just choosing random things. So if I wanted to know what the population of South Africa was, 
I, I basically had two choices. I could go to the set of encyclopedias that my dad bought when we were kids because he thought we would need them, and we did, and they were good. Um, and, and, but they were also already by that time five, six years old, and I, would, I knew that those numbers were not um, the same numbers that they would be today. So uh, what I would have to do is I'd go out. I'd have to go out. So let's say that I'm 17 years old, so I have my driver's license. Go out, get in the car. I have to drive to the library. I have to ask the librarian, you know, where where's the reference section? To go to the reference section, uh, I have to, uh, you know, find the with the right volume of the encyclopedia. I have to flip through pages, and then I can eventually page down and see what the population of South Africa is. And then I have to flip back to see what the copyright of the book is, because there's no guarantee that the library had up to date information, right? So it was a lot. It was different. Sorry. I went down the I went down the dad hole there for a minute, um, but uh, um, so the world so the Alexandrian conquest is uh, a smaller place, but it's also a larger place. It's a smaller place in the sense that um, oh well, so yeah. So nowadays, if you want to know what the population of South Africa is, it takes you I would imagine less than thirty seconds. You just go to Wikipedia, type in South Africa, scroll down a little box where it says population. Less than 30 seconds, probably less than 15 seconds. Um, uh, so the world is bigger, but it's also smaller. There's, it, it's, it's, uh, it's easier to get to places. Uh, interconnectedness uh, becomes um, a bit more of a thing. Um, I would never call either ancient Greek or ancient Roman societies uh, integrated or multicultural. Uh, they, were, they were multicultural in the sense, uh, particularly Roman society, because um, they brought a lot of slaves back from a lot of uh, far distant places, uh, and those slaves had kids. And uh, so there were different uh, uh, races and ethnicities all around ancient Rome. Um, and that was, it was a, a little bit the case for the ancient Greeks, but not, not to the same extent. Um, um, so it's, uh, yeah, right. So it's a small place, but it's also a bigger place because it's all this new stuff. Like there's all these other things that you never heard of, you ever dreamt of, you never thought of, you never saw. Uh, they bother you a little bit because they're so weird, but they also fascinate you a little bit because uh, they're fascinating. Uh, and so, so the, that, that's the that's the kind of world of of Menander, and uh, so now I'm going to wrap up. I promise I'm going to bring this back into the idea of new comedy. One of the things about new comedy is that it is it is written to be accessible to people uh, anywhere, no matter where they come from, right? So this is another thing that makes it fundamentally different from Aristophanes' new comedy. If you don't know. What's going on in Athens in that year or the last two years? You're not gonna. You're gonna only get. You're only gonna get the poop jokes <laughs> from Aristophanes. You're only gonna get the people running into each other and smacking each other jokes. You're not gonna get the references to the various politicians. You're not gonna get the references to the to Aristophanes uh, multiple uh, rival authors if you're not in Athens. Uh, 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 yeah, well, I was in a sense, I'm, yeah, never mind, I won't go, I'm not going to talk about that, but I'll leave you down another digression. Um, um, and so what Aristophanes is, or not Aristophanes, sorry, what Menander is writing is comedy that is marketable to places that are outside of Athens. He wants his plays to travel, right? He can, if his play is a hit in Athens, you know, if make it in, if I can make it there, I can make it anywhere. Uh, so if this plays a hit in Athens, he knows it's going to be reproduced in other places. So there's this dynamic, and again, we don't have any full new new comedies, or we don't have any comedies that survive um, uh, totally from any of the of the uh, dudes who were writing at the same time of Menander. So. Uh, uh, it would be misleading of me for you for to suggest that this is a universal rule for new comedy. I'm just working off the evidence uh, that we have.
So one of the things about my Andrews plays is I wrote it down. I said I wouldn't show it to you, but I'm going to show it to you anyway. It's marketability. You can now make a lot of money by your plays being produced in other city states. You will now get hired by magistrates and kings and uh, local kings and lords and uh, you know uh, elected officials to come and produce your plays. Uh, and so your plots have to be the sort of thing that uh, happen everywhere. Uh, um, it's not everywhere that that uh, citizens decide that there are too many lawsuits in their city, so they're going to build a sky up in the clouds, and that city that they build up in the clouds is then visited by a sequence of recognizable Athenian, uh, a, a cast of recognizable Athenian characters, uh, because those jokes aren't, they don't land uh, with people who live in uh, Syracuse uh, on Sicily, or they don't land with, you know, people who live in uh, Smyrna. Uh, they, so, but what 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 jokes do land? Uh, well, a guy fi guy falls down a hole. Never not funny. Um, that's always funny. Uh, that so we get that in the in the discolos, and then but the larger themes um, of like falling in love and being uh, frustrated because the dad doesn't approve and trying to prove yourself to the dad. Uh, but then the dad makes a fool of himself, and the son helps, or the future son-in-law, I should say, helps to rescue him. And, and then there's a marriage, and everybody parties, and then the dad, the grumpy dad, is uh, brought into the party, and everyone has a good time, right? So, oikea heidone, right? The joys of home. Uh, in fact, it's actually, we actually have, um, uh, I, I don't know if this is our earliest Example of this, um, I think it is, but it's a double marriage because Gorgias has a little sister um, and the, and the uh, um, unnamed woman that he marries uh, uh, has a brother and they get married uh, also. And uh, uh, yeah, now I realize I made a mistake. So if you have watched till the end of the video, you will realize the mistake I made. It's that the house next door to Canaemon's on stage does not belong to Callipides. It belongs to Canaemon's ex-wife. <laughs> the ex-wife of Canaemon. So she doesn't play any kind of... Up here. Wait. No, sorry. Up here. So uh, she doesn't play a big part in this play, but of course the uh, ex-wife, uh, who is a character type very closely related to the mother-in-law character, because uh, uh, they're both family members, but but not really family members, and so therefore seen as like you know not tolerable. We'll talk about that because. Uh, the ex, both the ex-wife and the mother-in-law are going to be uh, part of what we talk about uh, through a, more than one play uh, that we have left to do. So, okay, I'm going to shut up. Um, uh, I want to um, say thanks for watching. Uh, click the subscribe button. Sorry, just kidding. They say that at the end of every YouTube video. I don't care if you subscribe or not. I only care that you watch. Um, and... Uh, be nice um, and just be nice and wash your hands and um, uh, I miss you all and again I hope that uh, um, real soon that we can all be together. Okay, bye.